Okay, so uh, welcome back everyone to the One World Minds uh, seminar. Uh, this afternoon, we're very uh, pleased and happy to have uh, Michael Perlmutter um, from the Department of Mathematics at UCLA uh, speaking uh, to us. Uh, Mike is the Hedrick Assistant Professor at UCLA, uh, where his current research is focused on uh, the mathematics of data science, uh, including applied harmonic analysis and probability. Uh, he received his PhD uh, from Purdue University, uh, working on problems at the interface of probability and harmonic analysis. He then spent some time uh, in the Department of Statistics and Oper Operations Research at the University of North Carolina, um, where he worked on problems in high dimensional probability. Subsequently, he then came to Michigan State University, where uh, he had the uh, unfortunate circumstance to work under myself and uh, co-organizer co Mark Iwin. Um, there he did a lot of really excellent work on phase retrieval and the mathematics of deep learning. And now he is at UCLA where he's working with Yana Nidell and, and other folks um, on a host of different types of problems um, in applied data science and mathematics. And so today, Mike is going to talk about neural networks on directed graphs. Um, Mike, welcome to the One World Minds seminar. We're very pleased to have you and, and looking forward to your talk. All right. Thank you very much for, for the invitation. It's really, a, it's really exciting and a pleasure and an honor to be able to, uh, to speak here today. My talk is going to focus on neural networks for directed graphs. And in particular, I'm going to focus a lot on, on directed graphs, which is something that's a little bit less explored than the undirected ways. So as a starting point, what are graphs? Why do we care about them from a data science perspective? So a graph is anything that can be visualized as a bunch of dots called either vertices or nodes and lines between these dots called either edges or links. And these are a natural model for tons and tons of different things. So one very natural model would be um, molecules where the vertices could represent atoms and edges possibly weighted could represent bonds in between the atoms. And the other canonical example would be a social network where you, you might have a dot for every user on Facebook. And then there's a link between me and Matt if Matt and I are friends on Facebook. These are also natural models for things like email networks or even a citation networks where you'd have a vertex for every academic paper and then a link between these edges if one of these papers cites the other. So for an overview of my talk, I'm gonna outline some of the example tasks that we're interested in related to the graph from a data science perspective, and then talk about the key technical challenge of extending deep learning to the graph setting, which is coming up with a proper notion of graph convolution. Then after introducing um, some of the popular graph neural networks, I'm gonna describe some of their limitations and how we can overcome them. Namely the so-called over-smoothing uh, problem, which can be addressed via the graph scattering transform, which is better able to capture high frequency information and the inability of most popular neural networks to handle directed graphs, which we address in a uh, recent work called Magnet which uses a modified graph Laplacian for directed graphs. So first big family of graph tasks is graph level tasks. And there's many different types of graph level tasks. There's graph classification, where for example, you could be given a data set of a thousand molecules. And some of these molecules are known to be related to cancer and others are known not to be related to cancer. And what you want to do is you want to build a machine learning model that can input a new molecule and determine whether or not it's going to cause cancer. Alternatively, rather than yes or no, we might want to get a real valued output. This is graph regression, in which case we might have a data, data set of molecules and we know how much energy it takes to form them. And we want to be able to predict the formation energy of some new molecule. Or in, in a third example is graph synthesis, 
Here we might have a data set of different uh, molecules, which all represent, say, different drugs. And we want to generate a new graph, which looks like it was a member of the original data set that hopefully can be useful for uh, discovering new medications. The, the second big family of graph tasks is node level tasks. So here you might have a big graph which represents Facebook and you know the political affiliations of some of the users, but not all of them. And the question would be, is given that you know everybody who's friends with everybody else, can you predict the affiliations of the unknown users from the users who you do know their political affiliation? Alternatively, you might have no labels whatsoever, but you might want to split up the graph into meaningful subgroups, the node clustering problem. And then you could look at the different clusters and maybe market pro different products to, to different subgroups in the graph. And the last big family is edge level tasks. So this is something you've encountered with either people you may know in Facebook or recommenders on LinkedIn. And so here you have a collection of people. We know that Adam knows Maria, Maria knows Maya, and Maya knows Sophie. And based on all of this, we think, you know what, maybe there should be an, a link between Adam and Sophia, even though there isn't one. So those are the examples of tasks. And recently there's been a lot of interest in trying to solve these tasks using deep learning. And the idea is we wanna take everything that's great about CNNs for say image classification and adapt them so that they work on graphs. And the key insight is that CNNs are based on the uh, geometry of say an image where an image can be viewed as a nice regular grid of pixels. Now graphs, they, they have some structure to them, but it's not this Euclidean grid-like structure. And so the question is, is how can we take advantage of this modified structure and extend CNNs to graphs? So the, the key technical challenge is coming up with a proper notion of graph convolution. And there are two main big families of this. One is the spectral approach. This is motivated by the fact that Euclidean convolution is Fourier multiplication. So instead of um, using Fourier modes, we use the eigenvectors of a suitable Laplacian and then we define convolution using this as generalized Fourier multiplication. The, the other approach is the spatial approach, which I'm not going to focus on as much today, where in the spatial approach, you define convolution as a localized averaging algorithm. Then given either of these approaches, you can then construct a, a neural network through an alternating sequence of these convolutions and then pointwise nonlinear activation functions such as ReLU or absolute value or sigmoid, what have you. So brief boring notational slide for the rest of the talk. G equals VE is a graph with vertices V and edges E. We're gonna encode this graph by an adjacency matrix where there is a one in the JK entry if user J and user K are friends on Facebook. Um, in some contexts, we might want this adjacency to be weighted, although for simplicity, for most of the talk, we're going to assume that it's unweighted. By weighting, I assume that maybe, maybe Matt and I are friends, but Mark and I, we're not quite as good of friends. So there should be more weight given to the edge between me and Matt versus the uh, weight between me and Mark. Um, we also want to look at the degree matrix where the degree of a vertex is the number of friends a given user has, possibly counted by weight. And the, the degree matrix is just the diagonal matrix with the degree vector on its diagonal. We'll also need to pay attention to neighborhoods of each vertex, which for a user K is the set of J, such that user J is friends with user K. Um, 
So I'm mostly going to focus on defining convolution via spectral methods, which is meant on adapting signal processing to the graph setting. So in traditional signal processing, a signal can be seen as a function over time. And via the Fourier transform, it can be broken up into a superposition of different waves, which are oscillating at different frequencies. So then the, the function um, in the graph setting, we're gonna view a function on the vertices and we're gonna try to adapt um, the Fourier analysis to this using um, the eigenvectors of the graph Laplacian. So the graph Laplacian is gonna be the key to coming up with the general Fourier analysis. The problem is, is that there are many different definitions of the graph Laplacian. The, the first is the unnormalized graph Laplacian, which is obtained by subtracting the degree of matrix and the adjacency matrix. And then there's also various normalization schemes where you can either normalize this in a symmetric way or in an asymmetric way. Um, the asymmetric way is kind of nice because it, it has a nice correspondence with a random walk and probability theory. However, since it's an asymmetric matrix, analyzing its eigenvalues and eigenvectors is a little bit less friendly. So I'm gonna mostly focus on the symmetric normalized Laplacian. In any of these cases though, one way you can think about the Laplacian is a measure of how different is a signal from its neighbors at a given point. So for example, in this picture at the red dot, the signal is bigger than the average of its neighbors. And so the Laplacian is gonna be positive there. On the other hand, the blue dot, the signal is smaller than the average of its neighbors. So the Laplacian is gonna be negative there. If you think back to the averaging principle for harmonic functions and complex analysis, this is meant to kind of parallel that. The other connection to the traditional Laplacian is to look at the cycle graph. And if you compute the unnormalized graph Laplacian, you see that up to a normalization term of one over h squared, this is exactly the discrete second derivative. which I mean, in the one dimensional setting, the second derivative would be the Laplacian. You can also verify that the eigenvectors are the traditional discrete Fourier modes. And so it really is a direct parallel to say that the eigenvectors of a general graph Laplacian are in some sense generalized Fourier modes. And so that's basically going to be our base, our idea. We're going to look at the eigenvectors u1 through un of a suitable Laplacian, either the normalized or the unnormalized. And we note that we can factor L equal to u lambda u transpose, where u is the matrix uh, taken by, um, where each of the columns is a different eigenvector. And lambda is going to be a diagonal matrix with the eigenvalues on its main diagonal. And then frequency can be reframed in terms of the smoothness of the modes, uh, which can be computed using a quadratic form. It can also be visualized by this picture here, where here's the Euclidean case, you have things oscillating at different frequencies. And then going from top to bottom over here, we have a relatively smooth graph signal that doesn't change very much. And then progressively high frequency signals which where it changes a real lot as you go from one node to another. Given this intuition, you can then formally define a Fourier coefficient by taking the inner product of a signal with the Fourier mode. And then you can expand X in the Fourier basis since it's assumed to be an orthonormal basis. Or in matrix term, you can write X equals UX hat or X hat equals U transpose. X. So given this, we're going to use generalized Fourier analysis to define generalized convolution. 
In other words, if we have two signals X, one of which is called the, the filter Y, we define the convolution of Y and X to be the unique function whose kth Fourier coefficient is the product of the kth Fourier coefficient of the original two signals. And what you can verify through a slightly messy calculation is that if you then expand uh, Y star X in the Fourier basis, and then substitute back in the definition of X hat that is equal to U transpose times X, you can then write this as a, in matrix form as U Y hat U transpose, where Y hat is a diagonal matrix with Y hat along its main diagonal. And this was the uh, class of convolutions that was used in the, the first paper on convolutional graph neural networks using a spectral approach by uh, Johan Bruna and his collaborators in 2014. Now, there are several um, limitations to this that subsequent work has seek to address. And the first of which is that there is no formal relationship between Y hat and the eigenvalue of the graph Laplacian. And indeed, the eigenvalues of the graph Laplacian don't appear here any, anywhere. So something it seems to not quite, um, something seems to be missing. Um, other issues with this is computational cost. If we had a very large graph, say corresponding to all of Twitter, it would be impossibly uh, computationally costly to explicitly compute all of the eigenvectors and eigenvalues. Moreover, the number of free parameters is equal to the number of vertices. So there's a potential issue about overfitting. And because there's no direction, no relationship between Y and the eigenvectors of the, of the Laplacian, there's possible stability concerns where if you were to change a graph very slightly, you might get very different representations of the same input signal. So one of the big ideas on how we can address this is to assume that Y hat is a function of the eigenvalues, or in particular, we can consider polynomials of the graph Laplacian and a computation checks that you can write this as multiplication by what by um, by y hat, where y hat is equal to the polynomial evaluated at the kth eigenvalue. And therefore, you can write this succinctly in matrix form as P of L of X is equal to U, P of lambda, U transpose X, which this is identical to the equation from the previous slide, but P of lambda is being used in place of y hat. The other great thing about this is you don't actually need to compute any eigenvectors or eigenvalues. You can just compute polynomials of the graph Laplacian. So two popular papers that have used this approach are Shebnet and GCN. Shebnet came first, where we took this idea that we're gonna use polynomials of the graph Laplacian and we assume that these polynomials could be written in a Chebyshev basis, which allows for fast computation. Then shortly after this uh, came GCN of Kip and Welling. And this is probably the most widely cited paper on graph neural networks. Um, if, you, if you Google, how do I implement a, a graph neural network? The first link that'll pop up will be a tutorial on how to implement GCN. And what they did was they took the uh, Shevnik construction and made a number of uh, simplifications and uh, approximations. So what they did was they assumed that rather than having a single signal, we have a, a list of signals, X1 through XC, where XC uh, is the number of channels. We stack these in a matrix X. And then we assume a certain structure on the convolutions, namely we're gonna assume that the um, the Chebyshev polynomial is going to be first order, and we're also going to tie together the weights of the two coefficients. And after a bunch of computations, you arrive that this convolution corresponds to multiplying by this matrix called A hat. 
The explicit formula for A hat is that you take the adjacency matrix, you add the identity, um, you compute the associated degree matrix to this modified adjacency matrix, and then you normalize on the left and on the right. Um, that's a lot of equations. So if you haven't seen this before, you probably should not focus on that. But what I do want you to focus on is that this is all a very localized operator where all of the non-zero terms of A uh, correspond to either a vertex and itself or a vertex and its immediate neighbors. And so effectively what you can view GCN doing is trying to promote similarity between you and your immediate friend circle. So the resulting uh, convolution winds up looking like this, where you have a signal matrix X, you do a left multiplication by this A, and then you have a um, learnable matrix theta that shares information across channels. Now, this is actually a big difference between graph neural networks and traditional CNNs. Namely that this theta matrix here is learned, but this A matrix here is designed. And the reason why you need this additional structure is because the geometry of a graph is somewhat irregular. And so you can't just learn an arbitrary convolutional filter the way you could in the Euclidean case. So, as I already addressed, one of the potential limitations of GCN is that you're only computing similarity between yourself and your immediate first order circle of friends. And in the context that this network was developed in, that is absolutely perfectly fine. The setup here was you have a large network where you only have labels for a very small fraction of the nodes and you want to classify the other nodes. And a lot of these data sets were things like citation networks, such as Cora, where you have a data set of papers and you want to figure out what is the scientific area of a given paper. Now, if my paper is about data science, most of my immediate neighbors are papers I cite or papers who cite me. And those are probably also going to be about the same topic as my paper. And so therefore promoting similarity between immediate neighbors makes a ton of sense in this context. However, if you had a, a more complicated graph, this could be an oversimplification where you're throwing out any sort of long range interactions, which from a spectral perspective means that you're effectively applying a low pass filter and throwing away high frequency information. Uh, you're making this graph too smooth, which is why it's the so-called over-smoothing problem. So as I was already saying, A is basically a first order locally averaging operator. It promotes smoothness. And if you do out the computation, what you can check is that uh, multiplying by A, um, I'm ignoring some issues related to normalization, but if you ignore those, multiplying by A, leaves the bottom eigenvector unchanged, but all other frequencies are depressed. And so if you repeatedly apply uh, this convolution, you basically kill all high frequency information. And indeed, this is one of the reasons why many um, deep graph neural networks, they actually only use two layers, unlike the Euclidean case where you'd be using many, many layers. So there's been some work on trying to, to address this. And one of these is in place of low pass filters to use band pass filters, which we call diffusion wavelengths. So you're gonna have some diffusion operator, which I call K for the sake of generality. And this could either be a random walk matrix or it could be a symmetrized counterpart of a random walk matrix. And what you're going to do is you're going to raise this to dyadic powers, k to the 2 to the j, and subtract off these dyadic powers from one another. And what you can view this as is either saying, how different is my four-step neighborhood from my two-step neighborhood? 
how different is my eight step neighborhood from my four step neighborhood? Or in a cartoon picture of the spectral domain, you can view these different wavelets as being supported in mostly non overlapping different frequency bands. But in either case, this is meant to preserve more than just local information and more than just low frequency information. One can also verify that these operators are a non expansive frame on a, a suitable weighted space. Um, where I should mention I'm giving myself credit for this. Uh, the case where K was equal to T was already proved uh, previously though. So given this, what you can do is you can come up with a modified um, uh, graph neural network architecture, which uses um, an adaption of the scattering transform. So in the scattering transform, what you're going to do is you're going to take a signal, convolve it with a wavelet, apply a nonlinearity, and then repeat this process over and over again. And you call that UP of X. And then at each layer, you take the output of the previous layer, which starts off just being the input signal. You compute a scattering transform, and then you learn relationships between the channels. And then if it's useful, you might want to apply a bias term. So something I do want to emphasize here, this is designed and this is learned. So in this formulation of the graph scattering transform, it is exactly as much of a fully learned neural network as GCN and most other popular neural networks. And so what work by uh, Min et al did was they introduced a hybrid network where in some channels of their network, they used a GCN channel and some they used uh, scattering channels. And the idea is that these different channels capture, um, they capture different types of information GCN captures the low frequency and it's really good at getting the low frequency information and scattering is better able to capture the high frequency information. And so when you combine these two channels together, they have much more descriptive power than either of them just by themselves. So in some forthcoming work, we're going to do a theoretical analysis of this paper. And what we're going to we're going to prove is that the scattering network has strictly greater discriminatory power than than GCN. The fact that it has at least as much is is trivial because it's a hybrid network and there are GCN channels in it. But we're going to claim that it is strictly more expressive. And what we're going to do is we're going to introduce a geometric characterization of situations where GNC is guaranteed to fail. And then find a substantial subclass of this um, situation where scattering will succeed with overwhelming probability. Um, the proof of this theorem or even the precise statements would not be conducive to fitting on a slide. But here's a, um, a picture which is meant to illustrate the main idea. It's that here is a, a signal with GCN applied to it. And repeated applications lead towards the, um, the signal being the bottom eigenvector of the graph Laplacian, which in the normal case is a direct function of the degree vector. So here we can see that all of the vertices which have the same degree are essentially going to be the same value as all of the other vertices which have the same degree, except these two black dots in the middle have degree three. So they're going to be a different color. And these couple of graphs here are stuck in the middle. So their point, they're, even though they um, have degree two, they're caught in between the border of the degree three vertices and the degree two vertices. So they have to be somewhere halfway in between. Graph scattering, on the other hand, essentially every vertex is going to be a different color other than the, there's a kind of a symmetry to this picture, which does enforce some similarity, but a lot more information is being retained. So I should mention that there's been a lot of different work on graph scattering. The, the original was due to uh, Zhao and Lerman. 
uh, using Shannon wavelets. Then um, some work by Gamma et al. Uh, introduced uh, a diffusion-based approach based on the symmetrized random walk and conducted an extensive stability and invariance analysis. Work shortly following by Gao used asymmetric wavelets and um, show, demonstrated its effectiveness for graph classification using statistical moments of the graph scattering coefficients, but uh, didn't have any theoretical analysis. And then uh, work by uh, me and some other people, including uh, Matt, the organizer, um, conducted an invariance and stability analysis for these generalized diffusion wavelets, which is a bit more complicated because these matrices are not, these matrices are not symmetric and a lot of the um, spectral theory is more complicated because of that. There's also been a lot of development on trained versions of the graph scattering transform. There's the aforementioned paper by Min, which introduces a hybrid network. There was another paper by Min introducing an attention mechanism. There's been work by uh, Tong to learn the scales. So rather than using two to the J, maybe figure out what is the correct set of scales for a given graph. And then there's also been work uh, by Castro et al on using an autoencoder for molecule generation which this is like the uh, drug development graph synthesis problem that I mentioned in the beginning of the talk. I also, for people who are familiar with the Euclidean sc scattering transform, uh, I want to address the relationship between scattering and neural networks. Um, the original scattering transform was a wavelet-based model of CNNs, and it was a fully designed network whereas CNNs are able to learn basically arbitrary filters. So in the graph setting, both scattering and GCN have to incorporate design into their networks. And you can also incorporate learnable weights between the channels into a graph scattering framework. So really, scattering is just as much of a fully trained network as its competitors. It's not a mathematical model. It is a viable alternative, which may get better results depending on the context of your problem. The main difference is our design filters look differently and they incorporate high frequency information via bandpass filters rather than low pass filters. Um, for the versions that do not have cross channel convolutions, you also can get the similar theoretical guarantees to the original Euclidean scattering transform. Okay, so that is the end of part one of my talk. Uh, part two, I'm going to address a different limitation of uh, traditional graph neural networks, which is that they can't handle directed graphs. And I claim that this is problematic because directed graphs represent a natural model of many phenomena. Me citing your paper is not the same as you citing my paper. Me following you on Twitter might not be the same as you following me on Twitter. Same thing with web, website links, uh, one-way streets, et cetera. So we do have to ask ourselves, though, does direction matter? And this is because the most common approach when applying, say, GCN to a directed graph is to symmetrize the adjacency matrix and then treat the graph as undirected. And there actually are situations where this is reasonable. Namely, the motivational example that these networks were developed to solve was node classification on a citation network. And if my paper is labeled as data science, it's likely to cite papers related by data science, but also to be cited by other papers related to data science. So in this context, there really is no difference between a forward link and a backward link. However, though, there's other situations where directional information really is important. So we're gonna look at a, um, a data set of email networks, where we're gonna have um, the emails of a computer science department and the goal is to classify what the role of a user is. Are they a grad student? Are they a staff member? Are they a faculty member, et cetera? And it turns out people at different career stages 
have different email sending habits. And um, so therefore the directional information does improve performance in this context. Moreover, even in the context of citation networks, if we move away from node classification to link prediction, here directional information is very important. Since uh, there's a lot of academics in the audience, we all do know that having your paper get very many citations is very different than including a lot of references in your own paper, unfortunately. So our goal is to develop a flexible data-driven model, which can incorporate directional information in situations where it is important, but also systematically ignore it up here in situations where it's not. Uh, Mike? Uh, yes. Actually, there's a question in the Q&A. Uh, okay. The question is, um, a lot of the useful directed graphs are also acyclic. Um, does this make it easier to handle with uh, neural networks? Um, so if you, if, yeah, if you know in advance that your graph is, is a tree, and if it was a strictly directed tree, where there's like, it's a tree, but it's also a tree in the literal sense that the arrows are pointing the right way, then that certainly would make things easier and you'd be able to develop networks specifically for that case. Um, yeah, so if you knew in advance that your graph is a strictly ordered tree like that, I probably would develop a network specifically for that case. Okay, great, thank you. So to further illustrate the importance of um, directed graphs, we constructed a directed stochastic block model with the idea that if you're in cluster one, links go from cluster one to cluster two 90% of the time and go from cluster two to cluster one, uh, the other 10%. So in other words, everybody's equally likely to have some form of relationship, but links mostly flow from cluster one to cluster two. And in general, if you look at the asymmetric adjacency matrix, the clusters here are plain as day. But if you symmetrize it, you, they're, they're completely indistinguishable. Or more generally, you can represent models such as this as a metagraph, where we have a lot of interaction between um, cluster zero and cluster one and cluster four but most of the edges are falling, are flowing with the arrow. And then we also have some random noise edges because I believe we just wanted to make our life harder when we implemented this. Um, we're also interested in some real world data sets. So um, here is a model of um, social network activity by far right extremists. So, there's a network called Telegram, which is an encrypted uh, messaging app. And traditionally it's been used by say democracy advocates in uh, oppressive regimes. But more recently, uh, a lot of far right extremists have been getting kicked off of say Facebook, et cetera, Twitter, what have you. And so they've started going to this encrypted um, messaging system called uh, Telegram, which was traditionally used by uh, freedom fighters. And so some researchers in Oxford constructed a directive graph to, um, to model the influence of people on Telegram. Uh, I'm assuming that most people in the audience are neither far right extremists nor streaming this on a VPN from a country where, where they wouldn't need Telegram. So um, basically the way Telegram works is there's different types of sites. There can be websites or there can be channels or I believe there's also some green dots, which are called discussion forums. And what we can see is we are going to build a network of who influences who. And influence is based on you reposting my thing means that I influenced you. Although I should clarify, I am not on Telegram, so metaphorical me. Um, and anyways, what we can see is that there's a core of very influential channels 
And there's a periphery of a lot of semi-influential websites and then a and then a big core of some more or less influential channels. And so these are the examples of types of data sets we want to use too. And now I'm gonna talk about how we might try to address them using uh, neural networks. So one thing to note is that local neighborhoods are still well-defined. And so most spatial methods do actually have straightforward extensions. The problem is, is that they look at links going from J to K and completely ignore links going from K to J. And so they're basically picking half of the information and throwing out the other half in a more or less arbitrary manner. And so typically speaking, sp symmetrizing improves performance because at least this way you're not throwing out half of your information. Spectral approaches, it's not really clear what to do because there's not an obvious generalization of the graph Laplacian. What we're gonna propose is using a complex Hermitian matrix known as the magnetic Laplace. So the idea here is that we build a phase matrix, which looks at the difference between A of JK and A of KJ. We exponentiate this and multiply it by what's called a charge parameter Q, which this will be tuned uh, based off the data. And then we multiply this matrix, which, which was taken by exponentiating the phase matrix by a symmetrized adjacency matrix. And our intuition here is that complex numbers are the perfect vehicle for encoding information about directed graph because the undirected geometry can be captured in polar coordinates by the magnitude of each entry and the directional information is encoded by the complex phase or argument. Um, there are two special values of Q, one of which is zero, in which case the phase matrix gets killed off. And this is equivalent to treating the graph as undirected. Or if you set Q equal to 0.25, you can do some quick algebra and see that the, um, the matrices of JK will be the negative of the, of the KJ entry. In which case, now we're treating me influencing you as the exact opposite of you influencing me. So given the, the complex adjacency matrix, we can then um, define a complex Laplacian by formulas similar to the traditional Laplacian, either normalized or unnormalized. And you can verify that these are both gonna be Hermitian positive semi-definite matrices, similar to the traditional graph Laplacians. To me, it's very natural that this, um, this complex structure, what's a little bit less clear is why this set of complex matrices rather than some other. And I claim that there's three reasons for this. One, it appears in the physics literature. So it's a naturally occurring thing that we didn't make up. Two, there's a lot of mathematical literature on it, which hopefully means that we might be able to better understand our network in the future. And third, it, it, this has never been used in a graph neural network before, but it has been used in a lot of other data science applications such as clustering or community detection. Um, and so we think that this is really a reasonable choice to be our complex emission matrix to use in our, in our neural network. We can also look at its eigenvectors and eigenvalues. In the case of a directed cycle, the eigenvectors are going to again be the classical Fourier modes, but the eigenvalues will differ depending on the charge parameter. In the case of a directed star, what we can see is that a star with all the links pointing out versus all the links pointing in will have the same eigenvectors, but I'm oh, sorry, it will have different eigenvectors, but the same eigenvalue. So it's really important to know is that both the eigenvectors and the eigenvalues might be incorporating important directional information. So then given this, we then basically do what we do in the traditional case, which is we define convolution as a modified Fourier multiplication with this magnetic Laplacian in place of the traditional Laplacian. We show that we can adapt either the original network of Gruna 
or GCN or Shebnet to incorporate the magnetic Laplacian. And then we basically construct a standard graph neural network with these modifications. So in summary, it's, it's a very simple idea. You basically, you use this different matrix and then you, you do the same things that these other popular graph neural networks do, but using this, this Hermitian matrix allows you to understand directional information in direct graphs. I'm running low on time, so I'm gonna go pretty fast, but some other approaches are to construct three different um, Hermitian, three different matrices where you have your first order neighbors, you have second order neighbors where if I know you and he knows you, then I'm connected to him. Or it's if, if you, if he know, is if there's a second, if there's a common ingoing neighbor or a common outgoing neighbor, sorry, I was stuttering as rushing, but you basically, you construct three different adjacency matrix and run three different GCN channels in parallel. This works well, but it's very computationally expensive. And there are also approaches based on random walks and on page rank. And what these do is they use an algebraic relationship between the graph Laplacian and random, mat random walk matrices and, and their stationary distribution. And um, one of the downsides of this is that computing the stationary distribution on a directed graph is, is non-trivial. In any case, we applied um, these networks to a variety of papers. And uh, one of the things I want to point out is that the, in addition to getting good results, the best value of Q is always non-zero. This means that our network has learned that directional information is, is important with one and only one exception, Cora. This was the task of determining, is my paper the same type as, as your paper? Which intuitively, you know what, directional information really is not important in this setting because the papers I cite are related to me and the papers that cite me are related to me. Um, on synthetic data, we also uh, tested this out on some of those stochastic block models as illustrated earlier. And we also did link prediction. And again, the thing I wanna point out here, we did a couple of different types of link prediction, whether we should predict which direction a link is gonna go given that it's gonna go one way or the other, or is there going to be a link at all? But in all of these cases, the best choice of Q is not zero, even on these citation networks such as Cora. So really for link prediction, directional information is, is very important. And so I am running low on time, so this is where I'm going to stop. But in conclusion, um, graphs are a natural model for a wide variety of phenomena. And there's been tremendous success of graph neural networks in the past five to 10 years. But these have two limitations, um, over smoothing and the inability to process directional information. And ways we can overcome this are to incorporate bandpass filters using a graph scattering approach and to, or to replace the traditional Laplacian with the magnetic Laplacian to, uh, to handle directed graphs. And that is where I'm going to stop. Thank you very much for listening.